Hi, I'm Steve Murphy and welcome to the Insider Exclusive. Today, we are continuing our series on the headline civil rights news. We are going to be focusing on the death of Lawrence Taylor by the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. Brian Dunn, partner at the Cochran Firm, will be here discussing the case. Stay tuned. The suspect, as can be seen in the video, um, started to drive towards the deputy and actually accelerated towards the deputy. So the deputy that fired feared for his partner's safety, and he did what he had to do to save his partner. The chase began around 7.30 p.m. The pursuit raced through several streets. Authorities say the driver appeared to be drunk. Kids were out and about in the area. It was a very dangerous situation. The pursuit ended when the suspect circled a block four times before running over a spike strip. Shortly before reaching the spike strip, officials say the suspect aimed his car at a deputy, feeling threatened. Officers opened fire. A witness says it appeared to her that the suspect had already hit the spike strip, ending the pursuit, yet deputies shot into the car anyway. He's got the gun drawn, gun drawn, and he may be shooting the suspect. Six to eight bullets fired from a deputy's gun stopped a fleeing suspect dead in his tracks. Detectives say he repeatedly pulled the trigger after the 44-year-old driver aimed his car at the deputy's partner, who was laying a spike strip at Parmalee Avenue and 142nd Street. At the time of this fatal confrontation, pursuing deputies had no idea they had been chasing a parolee an ex-convict with an extensive criminal history that included two previous arrests for assaulting a police officer. I am very pleased to have with me today the lawyer of Lawrence Taylor, Brian Dunn of the Cochran Firm. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. You've been back here many times. You're always representing people generally that have been killed by the police. and we, Their families we, specifically. Yeah. And we have another situation. Uh, L.A. County Sheriff's Department, once again. That's correct. We're going to go to the video. The video sums it up perfectly. Let's go to that right now. Now, it all began earlier in the evening after a deputy observed the motorist, thought he was under the influence and a danger to the public, and tried to pull him over. But the driver wouldn't stop and instead led authorities on a chase that wound through neighborhoods. On this street, the driver takes a hard right in front of another vehicle, shooting across a vacant lot as he tries to evade sheriff's deputies. Later on during the pursuit, he drives through a busy intersection, an intersection partially shut down by sheriff's deputies as a safety precaution. It all came to an end around 7.41 in the evening near the intersection of Parmalee and 142nd Street. Here a deputy was laying down a spike strip. The suspect races around the corner, nearly striking the deputy who leaped out of the way to avoid being hit. His partner then opened fire. This is a tough case. It appears to me that the police really went against their policy of shooting an individual just because he's in a car. But on the other hand, the police, the sheriff's department, is saying or claiming that he was using his car as a deadly weapon. That's correct. Tell us exactly how you're going to handle this case. Well, that's a great question, Steve, and this is a very interesting case. Uh, but to begin with, to look at what happened out there that night, you have to start by analyzing the training that the officers had. And when you look at it from that perspective, you see that this particular incident resulted from a total breakdown in police procedures and police protocol. Specifically, uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department deputies, consistent with the policies of departments throughout the country, they're trained not to shoot at people present in moving motor vehicles to try to disable the vehicle. Right. They're trained that it's a bad policy. 
To shoot the individuals. To shoot into cars. Yes. To try to stop the car. You had another case where the Los Angeles Police Department, correct? fired into a vehicle killing a six-year-old boy. He was 13 years old. 13 yes. years old. That's correct. That, and that, that policy, the LAPD's policy, changed as a result of your case, didn't it? That's correct. And uh, I've had cases all throughout Southern California involving uh, officers and sheriff's deputies shooting at yeah. motor vehicles. Since 2005, we've seen changes in most of the policies uh, because what the people are starting to realize in the police departments, I mean the higher-ups, this just is not effective. Shooting at a person in a vehicle, even if you kill them, right. it doesn't stop the vehicle. You can completely disable the driver, but the vehicle keeps on going. It can even be a more dangerous situation sure. because a person uh, that's completely incapacitated uh, doesn't have the, the power uh, to keep the vehicle from doing something uh, that could endanger another person, right. an innocent pedestrian, for example. So my question, and I think everybody's question would be, if this Lawrence Taylor, they were chasing after him uh, as a result of, he had been drinking, so mm -hmm. it was a potential DUI. That's all he did. He Why didn't they just shoot the, the tires out of the car? I mean, they laid the tire strip down, as we saw in the video. Um, when he chose not to stop, even if the officer said he charged him with his car, why didn't they just shoot the tires out of the car because it would have stopped? Well, they're not typically trained to shoot at tires uh, because... Are you going to tell me they're trained to shoot at people? They're trained that if they shoot, yes, if they make the decision to shoot, yeah. they are trained to shoot to kill. Once they make that decision, uh, they are not trained to shoot to wound, they are not trained to shoot to disable. Is this in the training video that we're going to be seeing, or where do you get this information? From years of understanding police departments, and I'm familiar with the policies and practices of every department in Southern California, right. they are trained to shoot center mass. They're not even trained to shoot warning shots. Really? What they're trained is once they make the decision to shoot, they are trying to kill the person that they're shooting at. And that's no different yeah. when they're shooting uh, at people in moving motor vehicles. Yeah. Now, they'll tell you under oath, right. we were just trying to, quote, stop the threat, yeah. end quote. Stop the threat is a euphemism for kill the driver. <laughs> that is what yeah. they're trained to do. Well, here's a guy, what was he, 40 years old or something, right? And on the night of, what was it, August 1st, 2006, almost two years ago. Right. It was still daylight, daylight out. 7.42 in the evening. That's correct. He's driving his car. He's had too much to drink. He hasn't hit anybody, correct? No. The sheriff is seeing him driving, you know, haphazardly on the street. That's Wants correct. to pull him over. Right. He doesn't stop. Right. I, we notice in the video that there's about five cars that go after him, really aggressively. Correct. They lay the tire strip out there, which is common SOP, correct? Right. And the car looks to me like it's swerving to avoid the tire strip so the guy can get away, I guess. But the police, the sheriff department, believed that they were, he was using his car as a deadly weapon, and they chose to. How many bullets did they fire into him? He fired seven rounds total. And how many went into him? Four, right? Four rounds shot, Mr. Taylor. And okay. the autopsy report, which you have right there, says that he was shot where? He was shot four times, and that's very significant, Steve, and I, I want to bring that to your attention because what you're going to see is that uh, he was hit four times. Yes. Now, when you have situations in which officers kill someone, yeah. deadly officer-involved shootings, the coroner does an extensive analysis with regard to bullets, and the bullets are either, they fall into two categories. Mm -hmm. They're either fatal or they're non-fatal. Right. And Mr. Taylor was hit four times, and only one of those was a fatal wound. As you'll see from the autopsy report, two of the bullets went into his right arm. Yes. That's not going to kill somebody. Right. One of the bullets went to his right thigh. That's not going to kill someone. The bullet that killed him basically went into his back. Mm -hmm. It went into his back right under his right shoulder and went down, perforating his internal organs, it perforated his lungs, and he bled out on the scene. That means the car was already in front of the officer at the time the fatal shot was delivered. Good point. And what you can tell from the video is that by the time the car is in front of the officer, the other deputy, yeah. Deputy Amaya, to whom 
he's trying to protect is clearly out of the way yeah. at the time the fatal shot is delivered. So it's, it's a matter of timing here, isn't it? Yes. The officer is out of the line of fire. He's out of the, well... And you have, you have another officer firing to kill the person who he's going to claim in a, in a courtroom that he was protecting, correct? Right. Who didn't need any protection because that person is no longer in... The car had passed him. He was completely outside of the path of the vehicle at the time the fatal shot was delivered. It's undisputed, no matter whose policy that you look at, Steve, you're not supposed to keep shooting after the threat is over. Let's do this. Let's go back to that video so everybody can watch it one more time to show where the officer was, where the car was, and the point you're trying to make. So we're going to do that right now. The pursuit ended when the suspect circled a block four times before running over a spike strip. Shortly before reaching the spike strip, officials say the suspect aimed his car at a deputy, feeling threatened. Officers opened fire. A witness says it appeared to her that the suspect had already hit the spike strip, ending the pursuit, yet deputy shot into the car anyway. We now see that this is really the critical issue in your case, isn't it? Absolutely, Steve. When you think about it, that officer, once the danger had passed, that officer had no right to shoot the individual. Absolutely. You can't keep shooting yes. after the threat is over with. Absolutely. And in this particular case, the threat had ceased and he kept shooting. What you have to understand, Steve, and a lot of people take this for granted, is that we have to do an awful lot in California and in most states mm -hmm. to execute an individual. But not on the street. On the street, basically, for right. all intents and purposes, Lawrence Taylor got the death penalty. Sure. And the only thing that he was suspected of doing was driving drunk. When an officer kills an individual, that officer acts as judge, jury, executioner on the spot. And that is something that people take for granted. Right. Every round that is fired, every bullet that is fired, has the potential and the capacity to end the life of a human being. And there must be supreme reverence for that, supreme respect for that. Sure. It is not enough to say I was startled. It's not enough to even say I was scared. There has to be concrete, concrete proof that this person is going to pose a significant threat, death or serious bodily injury. Right then. Immediately. Right then. Immediately. Not Five seconds yeah. before, not even two seconds before. Did the police have any information, did the Sheriff's Department have any information on who he was? Absolutely not. Or his, what kind of person he was? Absolutely not. Did they have information that showed that he was a escaped convict? No. How about a felon no. charged with violent crime? So absolutely nothing. He could have been your newspaper delivery guy, right? Yeah. They you? knew nothing about him. And could have been somebody who, who just had a bad day at work and went to a bar yeah. after work and... Yeah. Uh, was drinking. The only thing that he did, well, he was a drunk driver yes. to them. Yes. And he didn't stop. Yes. And that is such a common occurrence in the field of law enforcement that they have specific tactics, specific procedures for how to deal with that phenomenon, and which is a person that may be under the influence of drugs or alcohol who's not stopping. There are so many things that they are trained to do uh, short of taking that person's life. You bring up a good point because you brought with you today a training video yes, that the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department shows to all their deputies to show them when to exercise and what, under what conditions to exercise lethal force, right? That's right, Steve. And that video was created by the Sheriff's Department prior to this incident. Okay. And yeah. by the way, we're going to go to the video right now. It starts out with Clint Eastwood, Dirty yeah. Harry, showing the, the audience, showing the, the new rookies, if you will, the Sheriff Department, right. what not to be, right? Exactly. So let's cut to that video right now. And again, it talks about the difference between movies yes. and what happens in movies, yes. and it compares that to what happens in the real world. Okay.
movies. They're great entertainment, but do they influence how we react as peace officers and how we do our job? Movies influence us more than we know. The movie industry uses stunt drivers, blanks, and special effects to sensationalize the action. We overlook this and think that a car will become incapacitated when we fire at the vehicle. Let's take a look at what really happens when you fire at a moving vehicle. Hey partner, that's Jack DeWen. He's good to go on a parole violation. The driver? Yeah, we'll stop him up here. He's got a passenger. You take the passenger, I'll take the driver. All right, hey, if they run, let's uh, stick with the driver. Yeah, I'm gonna run the plate real quick. There have been several recent instances when officers have found themselves forced into a tactical situation where they had to decide if a suspect vehicle was being used as a weapon. As the driver first backed into police. Now he's backing into the police car now. That is assault with a deadly weapon. PD right there. Oh, side swipe the LAPD. Another one. In this program, we'll explain some of the tactical options available to officers when a vehicle poses a threat. Our policy states that you shall not discharge your firearm at a motor vehicle or its occupants in response to a threat posed solely by the vehicle, unless you have an objectively reasonable belief that the vehicle or suspect poses an immediate threat of death or serious physical injury to the department member or another person, and the department member has no reasonable alternative course of action to prevent the death or serious injury the department member should always consider trying to get out of the way. Now, Brian, we've just seen the video. It says in there never to use deadly force stopping a vehicle except when the life of a law enforcement officer is in danger. As you brought up in the Lawrence Taylor case, we have a guy, the, the deputy is out of the line of fire. Right. He's out of danger. The other deputy is still shooting after him. That's correct. Do you know the person, do you know the people that did the training video? I know him very well. In fact, he testified in my last case. His name is Sergeant Romeo Pasquale. An active sheriff duty officer. He is a great cop. He's great for a lot of reasons. The primary reason I call him a great cop is because he has dedicated his life and his career to instructing deputies that are new and even seasoned deputies about what really happens in the real world. And one of the things that he talks about it may, seem, uh, it, it, it may seem interesting that he talks about this, but he talks about the difference between movies and how movies affect the perception mm -hmm. and how that compares to real life. And Sergeant Pasquale is about saving lives. He's about saving the lives not only of L.A. County Sheriff's Department deputies, but also of suspects right. that don't need to be uh, subjected to deadly force. And he talks about several things. He says, one of the things he says is that uh, you're not supposed to just keep firing. Okay, in this case, the deputy clipped, he, he shot off about seven rounds. So you're supposed to fire in bursts, fire once or twice, and reassess to see... The danger's still present. Exactly. Yeah. To see if the threat still exists. You know, you hear a lot about the adrenaline rush right. of law enforcement officers right. and they're human beings absolutely you know they're chasing somebody and you see a lot with on the tv shows where the police gone wild or you know people right. running away the adrenaline they stop the guy or they try to stop the guy it's pretty hard as a human being to all of a sudden turn off the adrenaline and not follow through with what you intended to do in the first place but these officers have a responsibility, and they have extra training, right? And they also to be able have to guns. Deal with that. They have they guns. Have, of course. And that's the power to take human life. Okay. And it's not enough. Well, let me just give you an example. Suppose you're on a plane. Right. And you're flying, and the officer hears a pop, or the, the pilot, excuse me, hears a pop and freaks out and drives the, or flies the plane into the side of a mountain. Yeah. Is that enough for him to say... I was scared. I heard something that startled me and I was scared. No. There is a procedure that he has to follow. 
he is a trained person. He has lives sure. that are entrusted to him. More so than the common person. Exactly. Okay. And because of that, he has special training. And when he hears something or sees something out of the ordinary, there are protocols that he has to follow. Right. There are things that he has to do. He can't just snap. Right. And let me let me ask you this. What happened to that officer? You know, it's 2006. It's August. We're almost two years later. What happens? You watch these movies where everybody hates a police shooting. I mean, I'm talking about the cops because there's internal investigations. You know, you might be put on the desk. Did that happen in this case? In this case, uh, the shooting was found to be within policy. Okay. And uh, that, that is what we almost see in every case. Justification. Right. Is that because they don't want to get sued? It may have something to do right. with uh, protecting against litigation, but mm -hmm. in almost every case, almost every case, and I mean virtually every single yes. case, there is going to be the benefit of the doubt given to uh, the officer's perspective. Right. And in this particular case, uh, the officer said that I believed my partner was in danger. And that's typically almost all they have to say mm -hmm. under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. Either I believed my partner was in danger or I believed that I was in danger. And that's enough to get past a internal investigation in most cases. Mm -hmm. However, juries look at it totally differently. I mean, as we saw in the case of Winston Hayes, right. uh, we tried that case and we won that case because the jury did not agree the that way, the officers... Uh, use of force was reasonable. We've now, yeah, I mean, you've been involved, I think you told me, seven cases, now eight cases, eight cases where um, someone was shot at by the police. In, it was a, the LA, in, a, in a vehicle. In a vehicle. I mean, I've had dozens where someone yeah. is shot at by, but I'm saying the phenomenon that we're seeing yeah. now is shooting at individuals in vehicles. Seven of them are dead. That's correct. He's Winston right. is the only one that's alive. The only one that survived. And you won the other six. Well, the other six are in litigation. I've settled most of them. Yeah. I have not lost one of them. Yeah. Uh, it would it, seem to me that when there's a shooting like this in an automobile, and they, the city loses millions of dollars, they do, they pay it, uh, it would seem to me that the smart thing to do is change the policy within the organization, pay the money, what's been paid out, you know, in other kinds of cases, and have a total change of the environment. Why isn't that happening? Well, I think that... There are many reasons for that. Number one, there is a very, uh, it's very difficult to change inertia. Yeah. And what you have is the rank and file police officers bumping heads with the higher ranking police officers right. saying this is the way we've always done it. And this is part of our culture. And this is part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it takes time to make those changes. Uh, shoot first and ask questions later is something that has existed uh, in the minds of law enforcement for a long time. We are making changes and each of these cases that we take and that we prosecute goes a long way towards making those changes. Unfortunately, the progress is not as fast as we'd like it to be. There are a lot of people who claim police misconduct, police brutality. Um, you must get a ton of phone calls. We do. Um, what, what is the criteria in your law firm and the, the Cochrane law firm, you know, the defender of the poor person, you know, the underprivileged person? What's your criteria in taking a case? We have to see an abuse of power, Steve. Yeah. I mean, we have to see that uh, something strikes us as an abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And as it, re as it works out in reality, most of the cases that we take involve death or people that have been seriously, seriously, seriously injured. Because yes. that's when you see, uh, in graphic detail, uh, the effects of this. I mean, when you have someone uh, that is dead, mm -hmm. and you're in the living room of their family, and there are pictures on the wall, and in many cases, when I walk up to the homes, there's candles that are outside of the home, and I come in and sit in the living room, and... I'm dealing with shell-shocked relatives. It actually brings home the gravity yes. of what it means to take a life mm -hmm. because it can't be replaced. And officers and people in general, they think about it in a, it was a shooting. It happened. He's dead.
Yeah, it's so impersonal. It's, and it's not. Yeah. It, it, the life is the most sacred thing. It's the most sacred thing we have. Mm -hmm. And when we see that, we say something has to be done for this family. Something has to be done to honor this man. Something has to be done so that we can at least say that we did everything possible to ensure that another family doesn't go through this. What is the status of Lawrence Taylor's case right now? It's scheduled for trial when? It's currently scheduled for trial in August okay. of this year, 2000. In a case like this, you will have maybe with a sheriff who has uh, written the training video or produced it, will he be testifying on behalf or is that a conflict of interest? He's probably going to be my first witness. What kind of other witnesses will you have on? Well, we have the actual officers yeah. testify. Uh, with regard to what their perceptions were. When you point out in the video, because I'm sure it's going to be shown again and again, again and, again, and again, again, but when you point out that the danger had passed, the danger had passed. What can that officer say? He's going to say that uh, the common thread in all of these cases is it was a split-second decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I was under the stress and excitement of a fast-moving event. Uh, I don't appreciate you, oh exactly, I don't appreciate you coming in and playing Monday morning quarterback. They try to portray me and my legal team as, you know, we weren't out there. It was very easy for us to talk about what happened in the comfort and, and, and uh, yeah. sanitized environment of this courtroom. I'm out there every day risking my life for the public and... You know, in, the, in, in, in war, and I, I equate that to the My Lai Massacre logic, you know, in war, there are rules of the game. Yeah. You know, you are trained as a professional to be able to better handle a situation because you're trained as a professional. Right. And if you can't handle those circumstances, then you shouldn't be in those shoes. Right. Well, I agree with that, Steve. And uh, every once in a while, a jury agrees with that, too. Why don't you give out your website? So people can call you, contact you. What is your website? Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, www.cochranfirm.com. C-O-C-H-R-A-N-F-I-R-M as in Mary, dot com. And you have worked there how long? Total 15 years. And you worked there when Johnny was there, right? Absolutely. You learned a lot from him, right? Yes, I did. We need people like you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for coming here, and good luck on your case. Thanks a lot, brother. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us and thanks for watching. You can get more information about our guests and the shows at www.insiderexclusive.tv. Thanks again.